I'm Mayor Shitrit from Israel. Coming from Israel, I've seen few developments in Israel, especially in the intelligent, artificial intelligence, which are really amazing. And I'd like to ask the panel members, what do you think are the risks of the artificial intelligence? I'm saying it because it was published that Facebook tried to teach computers to develop by themselves a software by talking to each other. And after a few months, they find out that those computers developed a totally new language and circumvent all their old guides, human guides. They start talking them between themselves without interference of the people who are working with them. And they close this operation totally and put off the computers because they were very afraid of what's going to happen if computers will take over. I'm asking to you if you are aware of those developing uh, dangers and what are the dangers. Right. Thank you. Revoking uh, Terminator Blade Runner theme. Uh, the computer's taken over, <laughs> the robot has taken over. Go ahead, please. Okay, Dania Khatib. I want, my question is Mr. for Mr. Nicoli. Many believe that technology had made our world less secure. You know, with the free flow of information, everything is accessible on the internet, radicalization is happening on the internet, especially now with social media. Who can like, like contain this, this, this monster? Do you think artificial intelligence is the antidote, especially when you spoke about the monitoring, about the voice recognition? Can artificial intelligence be the antidote for this monster created by technology? Can artificial intelligence make our world more secure five years from now? Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Could you pass on the mic to Rose behind you? The gentleman has been very patient. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much, Tatsu Master from Japan. I have a question to Mary. When I was working at the International Energy Agency in charge of oil market, I was constantly told by some producing countries, you are institutionally overestimating supply, underestimating demand to suppress prices. So if there are any institutional risks in OECD to, to, to say we shouldn't fear, the, we are exaggerating fears, but is it really the real feeling of you that there is no institutional tendency to underestimate fears and overestimate the positive side? Thank you. Quite very... Uh Heavy, important, and productive questions. We take two more with your permission and then round up. Uh, go ahead, please, gentlemen. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Don Johnston. Uh, really, my questions are to Masood and Mehdi on the labor market issues. Masood said uh, people who say we've seen this before uh, are really not correct. I think that's true to the extent that it's the speed of change that I worry about. But we have seen it before. Um, when I was at the OECD, the concern was Donald Trump's jobs moving to the developing world, from the developed world. The result of that is we have the kind of problems that have created his base in the United States. We did not adapt. We did not solve that problem. We didn't solve it in the United States. We didn't solve it in Canada. Now, what makes you think that we're going to be able to solve it with displacement by robots? Uh, and also, the other question is, the jobs that he wants to bring back, it sounds from the, what I hear, they're the very jobs that robots will be able to do. So. You know, where does that take us? So I just want to, want to know whether you think we're going to do better in the future than we have in the past. All right, thank you so much. Would you be so kind to pass on the mic uh, to the lady there? Go ahead, you get the last question. Hi, my name is Natalie Cartwright. I run an AI startup out of Canada. My question is for you, Patrick. Uh, and and uh, we were the winners of the Surge Camp Award, so we are grateful for Capgemini support. Um, you mentioned data in your presentation. From my perspective, the way that we manage data in this AI world is one of the most important and pressing policy questions. Curious if you've got a perspective on how we should start to approach that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, great questions, Masoud. Uh, take the ones that pertain to your field. Yes, I will. Uh, uh, I want to answer the questions that uh, Uri raised and then that Don uh, raised as well, because I think they're connected. See, I think Mari's presentation basically lays out nicely what you could achieve if everything was well and we were a well-organized society and we did the things we needed to do, train the people, retrain them, and things would work. The fact of the matter is, we're not. The fact of the matter is that the pace of technology for the next 10 years is going to be much faster, much deeper than the last 20 years. And as Don said, we've made a mess of it. I mean, so our explanation today is that it wasn't globalization, it was technology that accounts for 70% of the problems that we're experiencing amongst the unemployed. 
the next 10 years, the pace of technology will be faster. Why do you believe that we will be somehow so much more effective at tackling a bigger problem than we were at tackling a smaller one? If we can, I, I agree with you. You know, we'll be able to get there. I'm not so confident. Now, Uri's point, is it going to be jobs or is it going to be inequality? I think it will not be so much that jobs will disappear, Uri, in my view. I think what will happen is that the nature of jobs will change in a way that many of the people that are currently doing them will not be the right people to do the new jobs, and other people may be able to do them, but the ones who are displaced are not going to find other jobs for themselves. And this will exacerbate the inequality that we are now seeing, which we discussed yesterday in your panel. So I think inequality is going to become a much bigger problem. And similarly, education, I think we don't really understand what is the education that we need for the jobs of tomorrow. What we all say with great confidence is that the education we provide today is not the right education for tomorrow. But then you okay, okay, fine, so what should we teach our kids to do? And we say we should teach them to become better at problem solving, creativity, and learning as they go. But really, we don't have our education systems, our big bureaucracies, and to shift them to do more of that, particularly in countries where education delivery is localized and, and has a lot of diversity across, is going to be a hard slog ahead. So is this going to be the end of globalization? I think there are a variety of things that are impacting on globalization, which will make it happen in different ways and slower. But I think this will certainly exacerbate the internal social and political tensions and will fuel the kind of populist response that we have seen, which has conflated technology with globalization. So I think we do need to, to bear that in mind. Thank you so much, uh, Masood. Uh, Marie, uh, which questions uh, do you want to address? So there was one uh, directed to me uh, concerning that do we at the OECD underestimate the, the risks? Uh, no, I don't want to say that we don't uh, think about the risks, uh, but I'm a bit afraid of that, that if we are too afraid of the, uh, of, uh, the technological uh, change, uh, we don't use all the opportunities uh, uh, there are for every single country. Uh, to perform better, and also when it comes to societal well-being uh, of, of people. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities. But of course, we have to all the time uh, had a look at the, the risks uh, and the threats, uh, and that uh, is something which we have to face uh, together. And also when it comes to artificial intelligence and uh, the regulation, that is something that the countries really uh, have to do uh, together when it comes to uh, risks and also to privacy and uh, security uh, issues. But then to this question of um, jobs or inequality, what really is needed in, in all the countries the situation can be improved is the equality of opportunities so that every single person has the possibility to educate themselves, that it doesn't uh, uh, depend uh, on, on your uh, uh, background, as is the case in many, many countries now, that, that you, the countries really uh, can uh, provide um, quality education from the beginning, so every country can improve in that uh, uh, sense. Um, and then, when people are qualified, which is not the case uh, yet uh, in, in most of the countries, and when we think about the ICT skills, uh, we have found out that 50% of uh, adults in OECD countries have almost no ICT skills, or at least they are not adequate to really use uh, the opportunities and uh, take up uh, the job opportunities you have uh, in, in uh, all the countries. Uh, so not only the basic education, also the um, uh, uh, lifelong learning uh, possibilities. But then um, uh, the question uh, of, um, of uh, unemployment and like in Canada and USA, um, these countries have not been able to kind of uh, solve the challenge of uh, uh, technology um, or technological development and globalization. So the jobs lost uh, are mostly due uh, to uh, technological development, not uh, because of globalization. Um, 
but we have countries which have been able to solve the problem, like Germany, where the unemployment rate is uh, close to uh, zero. So you can uh, see concrete examples of uh, how uh, to face the challenges and how to solve them and uh, how to reduce uh, the unemployment uh, rate, also in a globalized uh, uh, world. Thank, thank you, Marie, for your perspective and also, once again, clarifying the OECD position on versus underestimating the risk, which obviously is not the case. Holga, there were a couple of questions that were relating to your field, I heard. Uh, I think that, first of all, many of the jobs um, that we know today won't exist in 20 years from now, but many of the jobs that will exist in 20 years from now, we don't, don't know even today. So it will be uh, adapting. Now, in the past, if you wanted to become rich, you had to invest into a company and invest a lot of money, capital, to build up a steel mill or whatever. Today you need a computer, internet access, some good ideas, and in a few years you might have a stock market capitalization of your company, which outweighs anything we know from the industrial age. So I think the opportunities grow, actually. Is there, are there any risk with it, artificial intelligence? Yes, yes, of course, but I, I think that the most terrible things we have seen in history that have been done to human beings have been done by human beings. So um, perhaps, if we think about artificial intelligence and how to program computers, at least at the beginning, we might actually improve humanity in a sense. Uh, we don't know. It's very open. But I think our legs did not invent the earth and the ability to walk. Our eyes did not invent the light and the ability to see. Our brain didn't invent intelligence and the ability to think. It was in evolutionary biology terms the other way around. It was, a, it was an answer by nature to a challenge, if you wish. And, and it was developed, of course, in a context. So, so our brain was developed, so to speak, in a, in a time when we never thought about quantum mechanics. And we do it because we can. Now, if the brain is not constructed, so to speak, on, on hydrocarbonate, but uh, d d d built on, on silicone or, or gallium arsenate, uh, what will be the difference? The artificial intelligence doesn't carry the package of, of the old days in the jungle and the savanna. Maybe an advantage, because as I said, I mean, there's so terrible things that people do to people, and uh, perhaps this whole development helps us to, to progress in an interesting direction, which contains risk, but also lots of opportunities. Thank you, Olga. Also, again, for uh, putting it in the historical, philosophical context for us, Patrick, uh, I heard a couple of questions yeah. that yeah. related to your field as well. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, so more practical. So on the risk side, you, you had a question on the risk side. So uh, the good news is that Facebook could stop the experiment, so it meant they were still in control. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's important. Again, the machines do what they are asked to do. Now you have to put in place the mechanism, the monitoring and management mechanism that allow you to, to, to stay in control. Uh, you have other risks that you not mentioned, uh, something I think very troubling like transhumanism, uh, development in transhumanism, and, and I would refer to uh, the message of Suzanne Liotto yesterday on ethic. It's a topic we've been discussing with her for years. How come that in this industry, maybe because there are too much money, the, the big companies are too rich, it's very difficult to have an ethical, launch an ethical debate. Suzanne is working on it. The same that we have had with biotechnology. We will need one so that we understand the consequences and that it creates a framework for the progress. So that would be one, one answer to this. On cybersecurity, um, Yes, you are right. Uh, we are only on the defender side, huh, to be clear. We, we never attack, uh, not only because I'm Swiss, but uh, it's a group policy. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, uh, we have attacked all sorts of attacks now. As I speak, we are attacked. So it's permanent, which means these attacks are automated. These attacks are AI-operated. So you, 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 you must defend yourself so it's machine against machine. It's, a, it's, a, it's an arms race where you escalate your means. It's cost a fortune for the companies. Huh? We don't like it. We have no choice. So it's an arms race. You must compete, and yes. 
Having said that, uh, in, in the companies, the, the one defending, 90% uh, of the compromission, let's call it this way, are created by human errors. Uh, human error is uh, uh, you let a subcontractor plug a PC directly in, uh, in your network without going through the right procedure. This PC is infected and then you have uh, 50,000 machines in a matter of uh, three seconds that are uh, uh, compromised. And you have a lot of these every day. So there is a lot about the discipline. And here again, as you cannot change all the behaviors, we would know it, uh, you have to automate. So reduce the number of human interaction with your systems that will reduce the number of mistakes. So yes, the answer is the arms race uh, in, in, in the cyberspace. When I come to the next one, uh, which is about managing data, I would like to put two things. The, the number one, and it was uh, uh, mentioned yesterday, is identity. Uh, because there are data where identity matters. And we discussed about fake news. Uh, you can think of your HR systems, etc. And uh, for the ones not involved in it, you will be surprised that one individual in one company has multiple identity. So you can imagine when you look at across all the systems where the individuals are connected. So identity is a, is a big challenge when it comes to data. And the second is ownership. And I think here it's a topic we are addressing with the IFRI and Thierry Montbrial is ownership of data. The American companies, the GAFAM, etc., have very rapidly understood the value in data. And, and they are fighting. Uh, I heard yesterday about the money, but uh, Microsoft, the, I, I thought one day I should sue them until I realized they had 800 senior lawyers in-house. Then I thought I better find something else. And, and they have built these capabilities to, uh, to protect the, and, and keep and, and leverage the value. And I think there is a deficit in Europe, and that's a question we're addressing with uh, Thierry. So identity and ownership. And uh, last point, practical on education, to give you uh, one number. Uh, practically what it means, we, we uh, made business by programming, and now we are reskilling 100,000 colleagues in India from code to order to assemble to order. This is a complete different work. And we have less than, we have maximum two years to do it. It's the scale. And, and uh, so for us, we need to equip them with soft skills that they didn't have, and then the hard skills to change the way they work. So uh, th this is a real practical uh, aspect we are confronted to. Olga, Marie, and uh, Masoud, uh, time is clicking mercilessly, but uh, very quick uh, last remarks. So what you say is uh, it's always an offense-defense competition. This is quite natural. There are microorganisms. We, we have a vaccination, then there's a mutation. It undermines the immune system. So that's very natural. Technology de development is natural. But we have to think also in evolution biology to learn about cyber resilience or the resilience against cyber attacks. If the cookie falls on the ground and the kid wants to eat it, let it eat it. It might get ill, but without a provocation and a challenge of the immune system, it will be not strengthened. So to be overprotective as parents is not a good idea. But there are certain diseases which you don't want the kid to get, like, like smallpox or so, because it's so deadly. So you do have to decouple. Evolution has the same. It's called isolation. It's niche developments, and you need both. So invite red teams. Let them attack you, learn to survive, but certain things don't put in the internet. Don't put a, a, a nuclear power, stand, a power plant on the internet, at, at least not the critical stuff. It's, firewalls don't help. Firewalls are as relevant as walls around medieval cities after invention of artillery. Nice, but useless against competent opponents. So at the end of the day, it's resilience because the fighting dog is not just dangerous because it can bite, it is so dangerous because you can beat this thing almost to death and it still bites. It can absorb strikes. Our societies, our economies, our companies need to learn how to absorb strikes. So resilience will be key for room for maneuver, actually. Thank you, Marie. So what is really needed, we, know, we, we need more uh, research and surveys and evidence uh, uh, in order to really face the challenges uh, of artificial uh, intelligence uh, and of the future. Um, and we 
discussed already a lot uh, of uh, education policies and skills, uh, but uh, what was also mentioned uh, uh, by a colleague here was uh, the universal basic in income. So in that area, I do encourage the countries which have introduced uh, these trials uh, on these systems uh, uh, to go further so that we can, based on that uh, uh, evidence, really have a look uh, how we could develop our social security uh, systems uh, uh, in order to uh, face the future of work better. Thank you so much. Masood, uh, we started with you, and so we're going to end with you. Take it away. Well, I think the only thing I want to say is that while I'm a bit cautious about the way in which we as society will manage the consequences, I say at a personal level, I'm quite looking forward to it because at the moment, when I talk to my car and ask it to dial a number, it either lowers the windows or it decides to switch to music for my daughter. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that the improvements in listening and learning that Patrick talked about will come soon enough that we will all benefit from many of the opportunities that artificial intelligence will bring to us. And at the risk of offending anyone, we won't mention what car you have. So <laughs> uh, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Thierry, I think uh, this is a topic that will be with us for a very long time to come. Probably we'll be talking about AI uh, at the 20th anniversary <laughs> of the WPC uh, as well. For now, ladies and gentlemen, I think I speak for all when I say this has been a very intricate, substantial and, of course, intelligent debate without any artificial ingredients. So with that, I want to thank this panel and thank you for your participation. Thank you.